Welcome to TMS Insights. The February reporting season is now over and we've got a lot of information to bring you today. So much so we're doing a two-part. This is the first video in the two parts. We're going to look at what's just happened in the reporting season. And then we're going to look at how the dealing desk here at TMS, which was very busy with the reporting season, found some very interesting stocks and some concepts within those reports that we want to bring to you now. So uh, a lot we've been up to, Ben, but maybe just recapture the market for the month of February uh, was marginally down 0.3% for the month. When you add in the dividends to the accumulation index, it was actually up about 0.4%. Very surprising given the way the month started. So a bit of volatility back in the markets. Uh, ben, Jerome Powell, at uh, his first opportunity at the Senate inquiry, did give indications that US rates would rise a little bit faster and further than people were thinking even a month ago. Yeah, and, and this is becoming the talking point is, you know, the the question everyone always wants to ask is where to from here? And I, I, I still think bond markets hold the key for where equity markets trade over the rest of this year. And um, why this is significant is, um, you know, we've obviously seen a change in the Fed governor from Yellen to Powell. Um, Yellen, I think, is someone who the markets felt had their back. Um, she was supportive of markets. She was probably willing to let inflation and the economy run a bit ahead of the cycle. Um, whereas Powell was quite adamant in his first briefing that, um, no, that's not going to happen. If we see signs of inflation, we'll start lifting rates faster. And, um, you know, so now the base expectation in the US is for three interest rate rises this year, but a possibility of a fourth. Mm, that's right. And, and economists are now starting to talk about a long bond of 4%, which changed a lot of models. And yeah. I think for an equity investor, you're preparing a little bit more for a bumpy ride. Last year, it was a smooth ride, a good return for the overall market. This year is going to provide possibly trading opportunities and some periods of weakness and strength. Yeah, I mean, yeah, last year was a year that we have never seen in history, and I don't know if we'll even ever see it again. You know, to see a year where every month we had a positive return and we didn't get a 3% correction for the entire 12 months is just abnormal. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to prepare for a more normal market, mm -hmm. and that's one where we do get some events like we saw at the end of January, start yeah. of February, 5% pullbacks are normal healthy things in a market. Um, and the key is, as I said, sort of to watch what interest rates are doing. And if those settings change too rapidly, we'll probably see a bigger pullback than 5%, I suspect, at some stage. Okay. Getting into reporting season, we want to bring to everybody the last week of reports and some of the key ones. Yeah. But you'd have to say it was a very good reporting season. Yeah, I, yeah, so. yeah overall, no, no, but in terms of beats and misses, 70% beat or met expectations, 30% missed, which is a good outcome really then. Definitely, I, I, I think for me, this is the best reporting season I've heard since the GFC. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, not just the numbers, it's also CEOs just feel more confident when you listen to them present. And they're also talking about investing a bit more aggressively, yeah, which right. is a theme that we've been missing in Australia for years now. So, um, you know, generally the outlook from a fundamental point of view has improved, I think, you know, looking forward. And um, that's what you've got to weigh up versus the macro environment. Yeah. Okay. So to speak of last week's results, um, Seek was dazzling again. Yep. Great numbers from there. Fantastic. Yep. Um, have a Mr. B, the... The international side of the business now is 50% of the overall profit. Yeah. I remember speaking about this several years mm -hmm. ago and it was 50% of their revenue. So yeah. it's amazing how that's swinging. But, um, you know, the domestic business had another great year. Yeah, it was surprisingly good, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 So look, it's I, I still think there's huge potential with Seek yeah. going forward five to ten years. Um, and they've got the management team, I think, who can deliver on it. Great. Um, Woolworths, a very good result. Let's also, in the same breath, Mention West Farmers, whose whose guidance prior to the result uh, lowered expectations, and the result was actually reasonable. But Woolworths is certainly in the supermarket game, got the ascendancy, hasn't it? Absolutely, I, you know the Brad Benedict have a great job of under promising and over, over delivering. A lot of CEOs could yeah. could learn from that, and um, you know I, I think the numbers continue to be well ahead of everyone's expectations. Um, West Farmers, interestingly. The first time that Bunnings earnings have had more of a contribution than Coles. So we can see there, there is still a great division in West Farmers. It's just that um, Coles, I think, is feeling the pressure of a much um, better run competitor. Yeah, no, it's 
So it's an interesting space. It's certainly changed a lot there. Uh, one that disappointed a bit uh, yesterday's result, the last day of the trade of the reporting season, Ramsey Health mm. uh, has had a fantastic run, mm. but some signs of, of strains of growth in Europe. Yeah, I, it, it was. I mean, it was a bit of a mixed bag because the Australian Hospitals Division, I, I thought, was a very solid set of numbers. Um, in France and in the UK, though, they had slightly negative revenue mm. growth and you know, sort of mid single digit negative earnings growth reflecting the high um, cost structure of their business. Um, so look, the, the demographic shift should be really favorable for them with a longer term view, but there is a sign of some margin pressure yeah. in the shorter term. So weighing that up as a shareholder is a bit tricky. Yeah. Still great assets, um, but certainly it seems to be a, a bit of a tougher time for them at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. So we mentioned we're going to bring you some insights into a couple of companies. Um, we're going to start with Ben and uh, myself in this part and then look at the rest of the, the guys and their thoughts in the second part. One stock that we looked at that was very interesting and I had a good time on the conference call was Boral. And Boral's been a stock which over a couple of decades hasn't necessarily delivered, but over the last few years since Mike Kane became CEO has been an outstanding performing stock. We're often concerned about big acquisitions in the market and the word synergy I often find is one of those great misused lies in the market. But the, the idea that uh, Headwaters, which was the $3.5 billion acquisition that Boral made in late 2016, funded with a rights issue, basically a one for two at $3.80. I might add the stock price now $7.80, so it's absolutely killed it. Uh, Boral has delivered uh, in a very short time more than the synergies expected at the time of the acquisition. And that's credit to, to the senior management and Mike Kane, who's banged the desk about the opportunities. He knew that business very well going into it. So the result overall was very pleasing and the outlook's very positive. But one of the insights that I wanted to bring was just how strong in Boral the, the value proposition of their land bank is. Now, I don't think that's really widely understood by investors in this space, but across its whole series of building materials, assets, quarries and the like, Ball is a, la a major landowner and recycles land over long periods, 50 to 100 years. And the simple equation is that they buy, so they've got currently 78 quarries around Australia and they use those for the building materials, tiles and bricks, etc. purposes for the life of the operation and then use it for land and residential development purposes later on, so accruing value over a long period of time. And Ben, why this is appealing, we don't necessarily, through our clients, hold enormous amounts of boral, but we do hold quite a lot of brickworks, and mm. they do quite the same thing. Mm. And the value doesn't necessarily appear obvious um, in these times when times are good, and they're good for boral, there's no doubt. These are positive times with up to $16 billion of infrastructure spend going on in Australia alone per annum yeah. at the moment. These are good times. Yeah. But in bad times, the value of those assets will be mispriced in the market yeah. and Boral will be, like Brickworks, quite cheap. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, I, I think, and very conservatively accounted in both companies, you know, they're not putting a market value of what that asset would be worth right now, of course, because it's still an operation which is separate to the land development, but it becomes a very valuable asset over time. So. You've got to take a long-term view, but I, you know, I, I agree with what you're sort of alluding to is these are cyclical businesses mm. and um, this should be a less cyclical business than many others because of the land bank as a backstop. And that's the same thing we've said often about Brickworks is mm. that there's something behind it which will mean that when they go through the inevitable downturns in the cycle, um, there's a lot of protection there yep. and there's a lot of value there and it's why you can be confident holding it through the cycle, but also in the next downturn, probably starting to get really keen in these sort right. of businesses. Because they've got that heavy asset yep. base underlying. Um, we're going to move on to Reliance Worldwide. Ben, you were on the call. You've watched this for a while. It's a really exciting Australian stock making big gains in the US. Yeah. Look, so this is um, another one not widely held. Um, again, we're not sort of suggesting go out and buy these companies um, tomorrow. It's more businesses that are a bit outside of the, often, what the ones we often uh, talk about that have reported well and sort of surprising information. And Reliance is, um, is a plumbing business that was started back in the, the 60s up in, um, up in Queensland. The Munns family acquired it in the 80s, uh, a Victorian uh, family. And, and they've rolled out the, the Shark Bite product in particular. It's really a game-changing sort of 
disruption before mm. disruption was a common word back in the... Um, so it's clicking plumbing behind the walls. That's walls. right. So what, what used to happen is, you know, you'd rough in your plumbing, um, a plumber would have to come in and solder and weld um, parts together to get turns, and they came out with this game-changing technology, which basically click, 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 cheaper, easier, less risk of damage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and Australia, Australian, the pl plumbing industry here has embraced that over the last three decades, and it's now the default product of use. There's other products in there like Hold Right they've recently bought and they've rolling out some other things. But in the US, amazingly, you know, welding is still the default way yeah. that plumbing is installed. And um, the company saw this opportunity um, probably about a decade ago now when it was still privately owned. Um, it was floated onto the stock exchange only a few years ago and has, has rolled out this product into America. Now, its, its product is now stocked in both Lowe's and Home Depot, which are the major two hardware chains in the country. And there's actually 23,000 locations where you can now buy mm. um, Reliance Worldwide's products. And, and what the company identified on the call is the CEO said, realistically, the, the young plumbers are embracing our technology. Yeah. They see the benefits, we educate them on it. But there is still a, a very large section of the industry who have welded and, and soldered all their lives and they're not going to change now. And so this is going to be a process. Generational opportunity. Right, yeah. it's going to take time. But there are the results already. It was, EBITDA was up 34% in Americans. Yeah, look, if we um, look at some of the key numbers out of the presentation, um, sales were up 28% um, and earnings were up 25% because they are still investing aggressively. They're doubling the size of their production plant in Alabama. Yeah. Um, but the thing that really stands out to me is the sales growth in the Americas. 34% mm. growth in Americas on a constant currency basis was just under 40% growth. So you're seeing real traction starting to occur. Very strong balance sheet. The Munns family are still large shareholders in the business. And it's a way, as with Borel probably, of playing the US house Absolutely. building yeah. thing. You yeah. know, um, a lot of the new housing developments that's been built will increasingly be used in a, you know, an Aussie patent and invention. Excellent. Well, there's a couple of the thoughts that we had and we noticed and we wanted to pass on to you. We're going to have a raft of more uh, other ideas from the desk in the second part of this series.